Good evening, everybody. Welcome at the season opening of Pakhuis de Zwijger. Thank you so much for being here uh, to kickstart the new season of dialogue, of uh, collaboration, of cooperation to envision and realize the city we all want. Um, thank you so much. This year we had a big brainstorm. How do, we, how do we wanna open the season for Pakhuis de Zwijger? And um, all the editors of Pakhuis de Zwijger came together and they said, let's invite this fantastic guest on our stage at We Make the City, a festival we organized in June last year, uh, just uh, at the end of last season. Uh, because he, uh, he had only 12 and a half minutes on stage, but um, everything he said was so uh, um, interesting that we should give him an entire evening. Uh, and uh, we were very honored that he was willing uh, to join us uh, in this opening night in the OR. So this evening is about imagining another future. Um, the title uh, of the series we want to kickstart this evening is called Urban Provocation. And uh, we, s we actually borrowed that from Indy Johar. So he's going to explain why we call it provocation. And the title, the subtitle is Towards a Civic Future. A future which is co-created, is created, is imagined by us, the civic we arm citizens. Um, and why it's so relevant for us to start with somebody who says we need to radically reimagine our institutions is because Pakas de Zwijger now exists for 12 years. And if we would have to think about a red thread between all conversations we organ organize on all these different topics, city makers, uh, companies, social entrepreneurs, our work academics are working on, um, it's that sometimes we find that the current way of organizing is the reason we cannot find proper solutions for the challenges we face in our future. Uh, so this red thread of we need new institutions is why we really wanted this season to be opened by Indy Johar. The evening has um, a format where I will uh, start the evening with a short interview where we will well, uh, ask uh, uh, Mr. Johar to explain his thinking. And then we will have three sessions, uh, three different topics where we are going to reimagine institutions um, on three th different sub uh, subjects. Um, Mr. Joer will introduce that topic uh, and then we will have a conversation with other guests on this table for about 20 minutes. Um, if there is um, somebody from the audience who wants to contribute to that conversation at the end of that 20 minutes, I will open the floor for the audience. Um, but if you still are thinking and imagining things, it's also okay to, to wait with posting your ideas or comments to the end of the evening after the three uh, different subjects have been discussed. And then uh, at 10 o'clock, uh, I'll close this session. Um, it's an honor to introduce him. Um, he, um, yeah, he's, uh, he's an interesting thinker. So um, let me just give him, uh, le he's, yeah, he, of course he's from Project Zero Zero, Dark Matter Laboratories, but he's gonna explain what that is to you. Give him a big welcome to the stage of Pakhuis de Zwijger in the OR. Yeah, Mr. Yar, thank you so much for being here. Delighted to be here. Um, so let's start with the title of the evening. We, 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 we bluntly stole it from, oh, well, it's a word which is, of course, used many times, but okay, we stole it from your website, um, provocation. Uh, why do you just use the word provocation instead of publication on your writings? Um, I, I just felt that I think we are living in a moment that many things that we uh, 
there's lots of things that are, are increasingly feel like that they are sacrosanct. They cannot be touched, they shouldn't be thought about, they shouldn't be examined. And I think increasingly we're living in a time that many of these things have to be rediscussed. And even if you go back into the history of them, they need to be challenged. So I, if you look back at the history of representative democracy, actually the, our current model was assumed actually to be Aristot uh, an aristocratic idea of democracy. It wasn't actually the democracy that was being argued about in the late, uh, in the kind of French Revolution, which is an allocated democracy, which is a fundamentally different. And this current framing of it is actually a rebadging of what was considered an arist aristocratic idea of democracy. And so I felt it was increasingly important that we start to challenge these sort of concepts and frameworks to allow ourselves the space to have different conversations. And I would use the word gentle provocations. It is not an argument but actually how do we start to give ourselves the freedom to have different deliberations around some of these fundamentals? Yeah, so, so, so the liberal, the representative democracy as we know it, you say that's sacrosanct, we cannot touch that. Um, it's, it's a notion which is seen as the best system and we cannot discuss that. What are other examples of these sacrosanct notions you gently want to make a provocation about? So ownership. Why, and, and, I, and by here I don't mean sharing economy as it's currently framed, but the thesis of ownership has been a construct of actually, everyone believed that if people owned things, they would look after them. And this is why ownership as a bundling of rights was seen as a mechanism from a way of seeing the world to being an effective means of organizing our land and resources. Increasingly, ownership is problematic because actually the notion of ownership creates a false idea that I own the glass, but the reality is I may own the glass, but actually the glass belongs to a whole ecosystem to which it must return if we're going to create circular sustainable environments. So the theory of ownership is problematic to the, to the idea of it being circular and relational to another ecosystem. So these sort of things, these theses, and it's not saying that ownership is wrong and they got it all wrong. It was right for the time that it was was considered, it just has become to the end of its usefulness as a concept. And I would argue that's just another one. But there are, I Sustainability, think- Sustainability perhaps? So, uh, you know, <laughs> so I have a problem with the words, the word sustainability. Um, and I think we must be really careful on language. So one of the things I would really talk about is language like sustainability, what are you sustaining? And actually the reality is, is is it sustainable what we're trying to sustain? Our current economy and our ecological systems aren't sustainable. Actually, we need a massive transformation in our relationship with our environment and our ecosystems as a whole. So the thesis of sustainability also creates an illusion that we can sustain what we have. And actually, that is not true. We're going to have to be fundamentally regenerative in our relationship and recast that relationship. So words become basis of how we see the world, but also how we structure our way and interventions in it. So words like sustainability, I think, if I would be really provocative, is a mechanism to sustain psychology, create an idea of sustaining the now. Mm. Okay. Now, this is soft proxies, but they're important because they bias our way of seeing the world and they bias the politic, and I don't mean political big P, I mean the linguistic politics that we become used to. And so words are also mechanisms of liberation or giving ourselves new freedoms. Exactly. So, buckles on. This is just two minutes of speaking. Um, and. Um, um, you will, you, a lot of times you think, but I really truly believe that this was a really nice idea and now it's off the table. Um, so, but it's also to create freedom, room for new imaginations. Um, uh, you, 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 you represent Project Zero Zero and Dark Matter Laboratories. What, what do you do actually in daily life? Daily life, a lot of the work that we're doing is around how do you democratize the capacity to build our world around us. And democracy with a sense of actual 
relationship or empathy I know, the, 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 with the world in a way that's radically different. So we were part of building the wiki house, open source housing infrastructure, open desk, open source furniture. Uh, we were part of building part of the uh, impact hub network when it was being set up. We were part of building social investment funds. We've tried lots of things, but also have quite hard reflections of some of these things where they work or they don't work. And lots of our, we tend to build things and make things. Uh, and one of the things that we came to, or I, certainly a few of us came to a conclusion about, was that everyone was focusing on making things. And actually what we found was more and more was that our institutional logics were the things that were deeply prob problematic. Exactly. So if you want to build preventative health, if you want to talk about preventive health, the reality is the reason why we don't have a preventive health economy is not because of not enough great ideas. There are hundreds of great ideas. The reason is because we don't have a public accounting mechanism that allows for the amortization of future liabilities to present value. So our current public accounting mechanism means that only 2% typically of national social care spend is on prevention when it could be significantly larger. So what you realize is the, the thesis of innovation is limited by the institutional infrastructures that we have. That's an example, that's a, the, the stats I give you are from Canadian context, but they're typically representative in many parts of the world. So it's these institutional infrastructures that actually set the paradigms of the logics that we talk about. So another one is even, I will just give one more example, the notion of the market, right? This is often, to, everyone talks about free market. Well, actually, if you talk to some of the people that really talk about, there's no such thing as rational behavior. None of us make rational choices as in, what we make is mimetic choices. We copy other people's behaviors. That is the way the most, the most influencing happens is by copying other people's behaviors. So it's mimetic organization of our social networks. So what you end up with is a thesis called free markets when actually the organizing principle is fundamentally different. And that dichotomy sets up fundamentally different relationships of how we see and organize things. So, and again, I'm not presenting new knowledge and this is other people's knowledge and work, but I think it's really important to give ourselves the freedom to interrogate these conversations and interrogate them because they affect every part of our daily life. And what does freedom mean when it becomes momentum? Yes. Okay, so, so and, uh, and how I'm gonna make sure that at 10 o'clock everybody is still at the, on the same page is if it's going too fast, you have to use your, yeah, um, your face to show me. Uh, so, if, so if half of the room is doing like, <laughs> then I know I have to slow down. But if you don't, some of you are like, uh-huh, uh-huh, I'm there, I'm there, then I continue, yeah? Okay. Um, so uh, the subtitle of this first urban provocation, thank you for urban gentle provocation, is towards a civic future. And the, the notion of civic is really relevant for you. Why? What do you mean with civic? Um, well, I, I would ar argue that the reason why civic is important is because the paradigm of the private and the public is a false paradigm. Yes. So I think the notion that something can be genuinely private economy is, a, is an illusion. It was a brilliant illusion that worked fantastically for three to 400 years. It just is no longer fit for purpose because we all recognize there's a fundamental interdependence of value. So in everything that we create, so 40% of, at least 40% of the balance sheet of most corporations is a function of public goods and public value. So, and I would argue then, even if we go further, and I often use this example, many of you may have heard, um, how, many of, how many of you people own a house here? Put your hands up. How many of your houses have gone up in value in the last 10 years? Everyone's hand goes up. Um, now the question is, if I was to take your house and move it to the middle of Nova Scotia, what is the value of your house? Near zero. So what has gone up in value? in your house. Exactly. So if that was a real estate you know, show, this would be location, location, location. So what does that mean? And here's the key words. Location is the monopolistic access to public goods. So you have privileged rights to labor markets, to schools, to parks, to transportation infrastructures. So what has gone up in value, unless you've added two more, ho two more rooms and made it energy, low energy, that's legitimate. What has actually gone up in value is actually the uh, public goods. 
So actually, most of your houses have gone up in value because public goods, i.e. the value of Amsterdam as a public institution has gone up in value. And this relationship has been miscast to, um, to understanding that my house has gone up in value. Right? Now, it is not my house, it is the public goods, to which you are getting a brilliant dividend. Right? You're getting a brilliant, unfair, probably, I would argue, dividend from that utility. So the question I would thesis that I think we have to start to think about, and this is where I will give, I'll later show an example, but I think it's important. The High Line in New York, how many of you know the High Line? Most of you, right? So the High Line in New York was funded with $278 million. Yeah. How many months do you think it would have taken for 10% of the land value uplift, just directly associated with the High Line? to pay for that 278 million. How many months? 100 months, 50 months? How many, give me some random numbers. Three months, 10 months, absolutely. So 10 months. Basically what happens is that public goods, so the High Line created massive amounts of private land value uplift all the way around. And the question is, we can now not only see that, but we can also understand it. And this is well recognized for schools and public assets. So I would argue the real challenge is we haven't had the economic models to invest in common goods, which are the foundational source of wealth in society. We've understood it the wrong way to say the house or the private asset is the foundational source. It's not. It's the leverage of those common goods. And I think what is opening up is an opportunity to be able to finance common goods for common value, which I think is the paradigm shift of being a private economy to being a civic economy, which I think levered, and this is a function of changing natures of bureaucracy and other things I can get into. Yes. Okay. So it's a really important that we try to create a civic future. And we're going to do that in three parts. We're going to have a, the first is about towards a sustainable civic future. Then we're going to talk about a thriving civic uh, uh, future. And then we're going to talk about a democratic civic future. And of course, they all intertwine and I mean are interconnected, these themes. But we try to break them up to get a genuine idea of what, what we should reimagine, free our thoughts and create new ideas. That's what, that, that's what we hope to achieve today. And of course, it's going to be much too short to really explore in detail what this reimagining, reinventing will actually entail. Uh, but uh, luckily, we have an entire year ahead of us in the programming in Pakhas de Zwijger to actually go into depth uh, on all these things, perhaps now only touched upon tonight. But then we'll promise that in November or in January or in March, we will continue this conversation on this important issue we think that we should reimagine things. Okay, are you ready? So he's going to get 10 minutes, the clock is there, um, to introduce the notion of a, a sustain, uh, sustainable civic future. Give him a warm welcome, a, a warm applause, uh, an applause for this first well, lecture, 10 minutes. So, um, look, we've got some brilliant people on the panel as well. So I'm really just doing a gentle provocation. But actually, um, actually, the reality is we have brilliant other speakers who are going to contribute a huge amount to this conversation. The one thing I would say is that setting the scene, I don't, I'm not trying to say these are truths, I'm just trying to open up space for all of us to have slightly different conversations. So hold the space to just give ourselves thought space to actually have that debate between ourselves. So um, the thing I want to put forward is this. I think one of the biggest challenges we face is big change. The scale of change that we're talking about is unprecedented. So if you look at the IPCC report, which is a conservative estimate, right, conservative estimate of the scale of change that we have to drive, it is un unimaginable the scale of change we're going to have to do over the next three years, maximum, three to five maximum, in the nature of our lives will be, will, if we survive as a, if we want to survive as a civilization, as a global civilization, will be of an order that is 
unimagined. Let us start the conversation from that perspective. Because I think that is the legitimate conversation that we have to start to deal with as actually as a, as a discourse. And if, if any of you read the um, CITRA report on living at one and a half degrees, if we want to maintain temperatures to only one and a half degrees higher, you have to, uh, the scale of lifestyle change is of an order that we cannot imagine. I'd really recommend read the CITRA report. At the same time, it's worth recognizing some of the biggest oil giants are modeling their futures on five degrees centigrade temperature change. At five degrees, we are literally talking billions of people dying, right? So it is really important. The second part I think, I think is really important to say is this, that climate change is a symptom of the problem. Do not, be, do not imagine climate change is the problem. The, we are creating externalities which are unpriced and are killing us, not just in climate change. I can talk about biodiversity loss, ecological systems loss, actually soil, soil depletion. It is happening systematically in every part of our lives that are foundational for us surviving as a global species. So really important, climate change is not the problem. It is a symptom of the problem. And when you look at it, what is then the problem is, I think, the really interesting question. So you all know this, right? So you've all seen some of this stuff happening. I'm going to shoot through this stuff. But it's really important to bear in mind how tangible all this is. Right? This is from, from 20, uh, tw uh, 1970s uh, onwards. Same thing. Just look at the kind of the kind of balance of the global life, livelihood. 4% of the world's mammals by weight are wild, 4%. That's all the zebras, all the kind of lions, everything you see and you go, oh my God, nature, it's 4%. <laughs> and really, you know, um, and that's since 1970. So since most of us have been living, that has been the scale of disruption in our lifetime, not in our grandparents and parents, pretty much in our lifetime. Scale of inequality, intangible economies, automation, scale, all these things that are coming at us, I'm gonna just shoot through them, but all of my big point is that these things cannot be dealt with in isolation. Right? This is why I, I refuse to talk about climate change. Actually, it's more important to talk about a great transition, which these things come together, and they have to be resolved together. Now, the thesis I want to put forward to you is the fundamental problem here is actually how we conceptualize ourselves. So if you want to deal with cl climate change, you have to start to think about two different things. The illusion of me as an individual is actually one of the big foundational problems that constructs the othering and my relationship with the world. So if you, have to, if you want to change this relationship, you have to start to re-understand humans as an emergent form of nature. We are fundamentally non-divisible for nature. So the great image I would love to have put up there, you know you get the great fantastic photographs of humans in space and humans isolated in this beautiful white suit and thinking we're going to colonize. The reality is humans are massively interdependent with our ecosystem, microbiomes, huge amount of vitamins, micronutrients, which are absolutely deeply embedded. We are non-divisible from our context, largely. And the illusion of being divisible is actually the thesis that is, that is the conceptual problem at the center of how we've constructed the world. So if you go back to the, uh, something like the uh, sort of uh, Newtonian enlightenment, which created the idea of isolating one thing from the other, and we isolated ourselves, that was the basis of how we then created a whole set of institutions, property rights. The idea, if I'm isolated, I can then own. Right? So if I'm, and if I'm isolated and, you know, I am me, then I, my, my, uh, my land is my castle, my house is my castle, then my property rights. So these psychological constructs have also constructed the institutions and relationships around us, the private limited company as an isolatable act. So I'm not saying these are all wrong. All I'm saying is that 
there is an underlying thesis that constructs our worldview and that constructs our institutions that we see around us. And if you challenge that, so if you challenge, so I would say Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man was actually a conceptualization of the individual as almost perfect. Whereas actually the reality is, if you marry it on Le Corbusier's Modular Man, what is the 22nd century version of being human? And I think that is the fundamental question we should ask ourselves. And I think most interesting parts of that, they challenge the notion of us being divisible. So we know in epigenetics terms, actually the impacts of poverty two generations down the line impact me. We know in terms of microviolence, actually the emotional violence that we exhibit, we have exhibited on us, uh, fi uh, actually fundamentally can take up to 10 years of uh, life of people because of actually the endorphins it releases and the kind of uh, uh, the, uh, the chemicals it releases in your bloodstream. So we know we're much more independent. Microbiomes affect your intelligence. Right? So we know this the level of interdependence. If those are true, how do we start to imagine things that are around us? What is our relationship with nature? So I think we've got brilliant speakers coming up who will talk about this. So we're doing something around, you know, there's some brilliant work going on in New Zealand talking about self-sovereign uh, self rivers. How do we start to reimagine our relationship with environmental assets, the relationship around the world? Now, I think fundamentally this is about reimagining ownership. But the thesis I want to really put down to you is that if we want to think about the structural challenges, we are going to have to reimagine the hard code coded deep code innovations at the center of society. Ideas of ownership, ideas of property rights. These things have been really brilliant but they've now become the end of their usefulness. And simultaneously, which is the really brilliant point, we have technology which allows us to open up new paradigms which were historically not possible because the cost of bureaucracy made them too difficult to organize. So you can unbundle rights, you can unbundle things, you can organize things in different ways, you can build self-sovereign uh, natural entities in a way that was historically virtually impossible. So it is almost at this perfect intersection, a new reality and relationship is possible. And I think it's really important that we start to think about it. So in a way, all of these things, and there's, there's a lot more detail in there that we can go into. But what I really want to talk about is sustainability. Firstly, you already know my thesis on why I think the word sustainability is problematic. And conceptually, it sets forward a politic which is problematic. But I think in order to deal with climate change or any of the sustainability issues, we have to start looking at the deep code structures. So why is it okay for investors to invest in companies which are actually producing externalities which are polluting the world? Why is this a legitimate idea of privatization of risk? So the risk of an investor who invests in Shell, let's use them as an example, who effectively invests in Shell, and that company is effectively creating huge amount of externalities, why is the risk not passing through to investors? Is this okay? Is this not okay? I'm not saying it should be one way or the other, but let's just give ourselves the freedom to recognize that that idea was born in the 17th century by Portuguese traders who wanted to actually trade and colonize the world because you had to put investor, investors into ships who could then go around the world without actually the risk of actually if those ships capsized or were taken over, those risks passing back to the investors. It was a very practical solution to a worldview that was born in a very particular moment in time. But if those risks are now non-divisible, um, non non-ignorable, uh, do we need a different reconceptualization? So I'm not saying this is the truth, I'm just inviting us to give ourselves the freedom to ask the questions whether this is the way to organize or not. And I think there's a whole series of conversations. So property rights, land rights, ownership. Do we need ownership? How, what does ownership mean in a circular economy? Right? What, what, and I'm not saying, by the way, that we give ownership to the big corporates in that thesis, right? And let's just be really clear about that. I'm not talking about the traditional sharing economy. I'm saying, is the concept of ownership a false paradigm? And actually, does technology allow us the freedom to challenge these things in ways which are radical? So there is a whole movement around self-sovereign 
building self-sovereign entities which become self-owning how do we embrace that what opportunities does it open up in new ways and i'm being closed so i think with that that's my gentle provocation and i think well hope and hope <laughs> gentle yeah, yeah but what i'm hoping is that this is part of a conversation over the whole year but also you've got brilliant speakers actually who i think will be able to concretize some of this stuff in really lovely ways Please, thank you yeah thank you so much yeah Please sit down. Um, yeah, so in every round we have two speakers uh, who will respond to this pr gentle provocation. Um, but uh, uh, one of our speakers uh, cancelled uh, just, uh, just this weekend. So we have, uh, we have in the first round only one speaker, which helps because it gives us a bit more time. Um, uh, so, so let me introduce uh, him. His name is Harpo Hart, and he is representing the Embassy of the North Sea, uh, part of the Parliament of Things. Give him a warm welcome. Welcome, Harpo Atart. Yeah. Okay. Let's start with the basics, uh, Harpo. Yes. What is the Embassy of the North Sea? Well, the Embassy of the North Sea, we believe that the North Sea belongs to itself. And it also should own itself. So it should not be owned by the countries surrounding it, nor by companies. So we view the North Sea as a political partner with a constituency stretching from the sea floor to the atmosphere, so from the smallest life like plankton to the biggest life, whales, humans. We call ourselves the embassy since we represent the North Sea as if it was a foreign country, as if it is a legal entity that is represented by us. This is uh, the, when we were founded last year, 2018, in The Hague. This is the flag of the North Sea, this is our flag. Um, so what we do, we strive for quite a big political change. So in our democracy, we want to give our non-human neighbors, like the warm Gulf Stream, herring, anybody living in the North Sea, literally, a seat at the table. Um, and we will do this until at least 2030. Um, and then we will hope that we can, in some way, give the North Sea back to itself. Yeah. Um, and so, so there was a, a, a bit of laughter, right? Uh, uh, but it's, it, and it sounds like a fun, fun I, a nice artistic idea, but you're that serious. Yes. Well, the point is it's very weird. Since, look at this picture, this is a session of the Parliament of Things. This is what we, what we do. Um, and we are trying to represent all these actors. And yeah. we are very much not used to doing it. I mean, there's a dead seagull, some plastic stuff. Huh? Not used stuff, whatever, that's just there. But actually stuff is doing a lot and it's part of our ecosystem. We are stuff as well. Um, so, yes, we find this weird, because what is the political voice of a seagull? Yeah, that's just weird. We're never used to think, thinking oh, in this how, way. Because, of course, parliament means, po comes from the word palais, talking. Yes, yeah. And we cannot imagine having a civic conversation with a whale or a seagull. Well, in the but the whales, people have really tried. Yeah, um, <laughs> true, true, true. <laughs> and they're yeah. really interesting. Um, <clears throat> well, so a conversation, any conversation, of course, starts with listening. Um, listening is actually the first thing that has to be done if you want to be in a just relationship. If you don't listen, nothing can happen. So we have to find ways device tools to listen to these strange actors, strange people. Um, so we work together with artists, designers and scientists who are helping us find ways of listening, ways of seeing images to begin with listening. Because after a while we will be able to I'm saying this confidently, we'll be able to speak on behalf of these 
entities, entities or bodies. Yeah, yeah, bodies with rights. Yeah, but we will definitely yeah. have to start by listening. And, and that's because it's also funny, uh, that's why it's also interesting that your professional background is that you are a sound engineer. Sound artist. Artist, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and from that respect, um, I got very interested in listening. As a composer, we are told that we organize sound, which is a very um, dry way of putting it, because we are rather organizing listening situations. And in listening situations, you already take into account that there are people coming to listen and that there is a dialogue. The audience is a listener bringing something to the table. So in thinking about, more thinking about listening and how important it is and what stuff, like my microphone, is bringing to the table in our listening situation, is actually doing. This laid the groundwork for the thinking of the embassy, how to listen to non-humans, because non-humans also are actively bringing something to the table. Yeah. What do you think about this, this notion, uh, Mr. Yower? Well, I think it's brilliant. Um, and why? I, 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 I'll tell you why. I, so everything slightly out of the norm, norm can be funny, mm -hmm. but let's put this into context, right? So we're doing work with indigenous nations in Canada. If you talk to indigenous nations leaders, uh, they will tell you that worldview is actually the only appropriate worldview. Yes. Right? <laughs> they will tell you, no, the tree is self-sovereign, it is living by itself, it is equivalent to, to me. Mm -hmm. So this paradigm on one side. At the other side we're seeing, and I think, you know, brilliant examples, whether it's in New Zealand, a river being made self-sovereign, River Ganges, um, and others. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you've got technologists who are talking about self-sovereign cars which own themselves. Yeah. So be really conscious that there is a, it's not just a one, you know, one brilliant person. Actually, what you have is a whole movement of people that are thinking about this. And that usually signals something critical is on the table. Yes. And when I talk about the indigenous nations aspect, that is the way they are reconstituting their nations is on a foundationally different idea of relationship, of, uh, of how we cohabit the landscape. That requires a different in, a structural question. So I would say this is a foundationally different frame, but mm -hmm. a critical frame of our transition that we're in the middle of. That's why I think if you put this into the wider context and the wider movement, there's obviously the movement of self-earning environmental assets, but if you put this into the wider movement, I think this is one of the leading conversations. Now, the challenge and I would put into the table is that I think this is a, what I'd call the horizon, first horizon. We challenge the idea of self-sovereignty, we bring these conversations. I think the fundamental questions are actually to do with us. Mm -hmm. um, because we're currently basically, like we talk about the financialization of the whole world, uh, we are also legalizing the whole world in a way. Yeah. And so the question is, is, is that the end goal? Or is it a proxy to a different type of goal where we actually change our relationship with ourselves and the world itself? Mm -hmm. And that is a different notion of ownership and cohabitation and the idea of human existence as, as we acknowledge ourselves. So it just, and these ideas are not non-consistent. See them as an arc yeah. of trajectory. And they are critical mind milestones in moving us forward in being able to see the world in this yeah. way. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine um, in the new future that this now uh, artistic or some or, or even uh, very well in in a small niche of the world happening all these initiatives which are a global movement but they're that actually non-human entities get legal status it's already, it's already happening yeah, yeah. <clears throat> because the, the ganges has been the wanganui river parts of the rainforest the amazon in colombia are uh, have, have the legal status as well would that have been the case in Brazil, then we would have maybe have been a able different conversation, to yeah. do something about this. And <clears throat> interesting that you mentioned that is the first horizon, the legali yeah, legalization. Because what, what happens a lot when I talk about this is that people jump on this legal person issue, like, ah, that's like something concrete. Yes, that's co something we can do. But um, on the other hand, but actually when something is set into law, 
it has to be a practice, something that we do, something that we are accustomed to. So <clears throat> that is the reason why we are actually doing this work starting from an artistic listening point of view, because yeah. we have to first get the concepts and the ideas before we can, and we, then we can practice it. So it's the legalization, it's something that we can definitely do and we really want to do it, but we have to be serious in giving this entity a voice. Exactly, that's, that's the goal. We want to give them a voice and we want to acknowledge that it has a right in itself to uh, have a seat on the table. Exactly, yes. To, to decide upon their own future, yeah. Um, so what would happen, because this evening is not about right or wrong, or about is this, a, uh, but it's about Im what happens when you allow yourself to imagine this, right? Mm -hmm. So if this would be common practice, so the first step in the horizon, so non-human entities, uh, zebras, um, the desert, but also maybe bricks, mm -hmm. uh, uh, non non-human things and animals and living creatures are getting rights and a seat at the table to represent themselves and their future. Yeah. What would change? How would we come to the second part? What kind of, what would change the conversation? I, here I would just actually ask yourself. What would <laughs> happen? Yeah, imagine. Yeah. But really think about that. Yeah. Imagine so it's really, I'll give you a practical example. I was, went into the shower. There's a huge spider, massive spider. In the Where? Shower. Not, not here, <laughs> my, in my house, right? Okay. Massive spider. And I was like, hmm, right. <laughs> Good dilemma, right. yeah. Now, the, the dilemma here is if I'm not willing to kill this thing and I have guilt about killing it, say, or, you know, crunching it up, moving it away, then how the hell do I eat my meat and everything else? And the reason why it is, is fundamentally, it is about changing your relationship with the world. Mm -hmm. It is actually, it is not about the things, it is also about changing how you perceive your relationship in the world. Your relationship in the world is perceived currently through ownership. Yes. You own your land, you own this thing, you can own animals, right? You can own animals. Mm -hmm. um, you can own the labor rights of people, right? This is ownership. I don't think that model of conceptual model holds deep enough into this X frame. It doesn't even hope enough to give us you know, a circular economy. So I think for me, you know, there's another little experiment I love to do. And I've tried this with myself, so it's not just random things. It's, Imagine talking to the person next to you and saying, we, don't refer yourself as I, refer to yourself as we. Right? Okay, and we, then you introduce yourself. We like doing this. And just refer, talk to your person next. Oh, that's interesting because we, in the Dutch it's really interesting because in English you don't have the problem, but we have called the majestic plurality, uh -huh. which is used by queens they, and kings. We, yeah. Exactly, and I think... Yeah, so now they all have to imagine that there are kings but and then they're going to... Uh, no, but this is really important. So the, the majestic plural, I yeah. love that term, thank you. Um, <laughs> the majestic plural needs to be adopted. You are all kings and queens. Exactly. That's <laughs> easier. And so now you're going to discuss who you are, introduce yourself to your neighbor if you know them, to something you don't know, and use the majestic and plural. Just remember, you are a function of 12 billion years of evolution. There <laughs> is gold inside you, which is the function of actual stars having had to explode to make you. And the, literally, this is all fact, right? There's elements in you that could only have been made in supernovas of stars mm -hmm. to make you, right? And 12 billion years of history had to come into play for you to exist right now in this right this moment, right? At this moment in time, you are majestic. You are the majestic. Now, if you introduce yourself as the we, the representative of all of that, how do you start to conceive yourself? So I would ask, it would be great exercise for two yeah. minutes to just introduce yourself through the language of we. Yes, and do it to somebody you, you actually want to uh, introduce yourself to. So if you already know each other, do it with somebody else around you. So just walk, if you have to walk, walk, but you have one minute to introduce yourself. <laughs> 
Some people, yeah. Okay, 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 okay. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, if you really like the we uh, at the other in the conversation, make an appointment to see each other at 10 o'clock at the bar. You can continue this royal conversation you just had. Uh, but just let me ask here, how did it feel? Um, a little bit um, unusual at first, but uh, I think uh, it got the conversation rolling quite, quite well. Yeah, what happened? What, 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 ch what made the change between if you would have said I, and now you realize you're part of a 12 billion years evolution? Well, we had a very good introduction, uh, obviously, but uh, it changed uh, uh, the, the perspective completely of yeah, what you can talk about, puts it in a bigger picture. Interesting. You said it was hard, I heard, uh, saying why? Right. Um, well, because I always wanted to go from we to I. <laughs> and you have to change your sentences. You can't say, well... I'm not uh, used to be a queen, so I'm not used to speak like that. And that's, that's, that's funny. Yeah. It's I, I, look, the reason why I said this, and I think it's is exactly this. I think the challenge is the, is the really interesting point. Because I think in the acknowledgement of the we, you have to acknowledge that you are not just individual and isolated. You have to acknowledge your interdependence, both in yourself Right? the multitudes of organisms that exist in you, but the multitude of relationships through which you exist. And the taxonomy of language that we use structures the relationships in the world that we make. Language constructs the world around us. And I know it's a very philosophical perspective, but I think small tweaks like this, and you're seeing the revolution of pronouns in, sort of in, in, in the gender debate, which is really going on. I think that's a uh, that's a forerunner of a different discussion of self that allows us to then be actually deal with sustainability in a foundationally different way. Okay. And the big point I was just trying to make is you have to reimagine yourself in order to be able to recast the institutions of sustainability yeah. into this discourse. Harpo, so um, uh, this conversation was really beautiful, of course, imagining this, this legal status as a stepping stone mm -hmm. um, um, uh, of... of, of seeing yourself in a different perspective, right? Yes. Um, and your relationship with the world. Uh -huh. um, how does this help us with the urgency uh, in the OR uh, started this provocation with? We only have three and a half years left to yeah. get, because then our carbon budget is finished. Uh, if we want to stay below the or on the one and a half degrees, temperatures rise. Yeah, we have uh, so, 2030. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so how does this connect this urgent message we have no time left yes. and, and well, this debate or this discussion or exploration? Well, two things. First of all, the urgency shows us 
sort of our place in the world, since the, how what we used to call nature now acts upon us. The say, sea levels are rising, the earth is warming up, stuff is changing, and we can't do anything about this in, a, in, in an instant. So this shows us we are part of an ecosystem. Um, so this, what we are um, proposing, is politics in the age of climate change. So even if things go terribly wrong, this is the way we should do politics anyway. Okay. Um, that's one. And secondly, <clears throat> what we hope to achieve, or believe we can achieve, if things have rights, we can um, really make a case. And this okay. could speed up things. Okay. Last words for you in this. Uh, so in this frame, uh, in three and a half years, change will only happen if we can construct legitimacy. So the biggest obstacle for innovation is not the ideas, it is the social construction of legitimacy. Yeah, and this do is, people believe we should do it? And actually, places like here, places like Wagenstuhl, these are foundational anchor places for a new deliberative conversation that we need to have together to be able to construct change at speed. It is only through the deliberative legitimacy and the really precise taxonomy, the language of the we, why did I do that, is by framing it through that lens, you will have different conversations and different realizations of self. And in that discourse, we will open up new ways of dealing with this crisis. The technology is not the problem. The construction of us, the ability for us to legitimize change is the biggest problem we face. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Harpo Tart. Give him a thank you. Um, yeah. We're going to go to the, to the second provocation or the sub uh, theme, and it's going to be to, you're going to talk about a thriving civic future. Again, Inilo, Johar, please so, uh, take the floor. Again, I'm going to try to make this relatively quick. So, my, my point here is, and I alluded to it earlier, that actually it is our common goods that create private value. Now, why I say this, and, and it's kind of evidenced by lots of things, whether it's, you know, now here's a kind of challenge. Our common goods are also trees, right? Where do trees sit on the balance sheet of a city? Does anyone know? Yeah, expense. They sit on the cost side, they sit on the expense side. So yet they provide a huge amount and I use the term environmental services, which is, I think, problematic, but I, it's, for use, it's, for, it's for deliberate use. They provide huge amount of value to all of our society around us. So they provide, whether it's actually air pollution, mental health, whether they provide actually sustainable urban drainage, huge amount of services are provided to our society. Yet our accounting infrastructures fundamentally treat them as a cost. And when you treat them as a cost, what, you, what do you do? You look to minimize trees to being uh, the most, um, you, uh, to reduce your cost, not optimize your value, right? So we create a whole bunch of trees which are actually aesthetically trees, but actually the environmental services are not optimized. They're not even thought through that lens. Now that is an accounting problem, but we increasingly know that actually the, these are public goods which provide huge amounts of value. Now the challenge is, can we construct and organize that value? Same thing, the High Line in New York, huge amounts of value, 10 months. It took 10 months of land value uplift directly associated with the High Line, I'll show you this, to actually pay for the whole High Line. There is no private sector project out there that creates that much value at that much speed, full stop, legitimately, without it being illegal money. 10 months payback period, all 278 million. We know actually private disused property creates negative spillovers. At the same time, our concepts of kind of even how we organize most of this stuff, most of our health economy is organized through the idea of treatment, right? It's not even organized through the idea of prevention. Why? Like I said, our public accounting books don't look at future liabilities to bring back to present value. And further, they don't even look at thriving. So not this prevention, but actually if you were to radically improve people's lives, their mental health capacity, by 30 to 40%, what would be economy and society look like? 
in that future. Now, in the public health in, in the 19th century, we reinvented our cities to, because we understood environmental context created efficient labor. The 21st century is going to have to reimagine our cities and environments for actually unlo unlocking a huge amount of thriving cognitive capabilities, cognitive surpluses, emotional surpluses. How do we build an economy for that? That is a different economic thesis that actually has to be on the table to allow us to build those cities. I don't know if this is GIF, if this GIF will work. Will it work? Yes. So this was this is some of the work that we've been doing on the High Line. But again, what you'll see is actually the uplift in property value. And there's another one, which this actually particularly casts it entirely around the High Line. And I can, there's, a, there's a blog post coming out in the next few days where you can literally in detail see what we've done in terms of construction of that whole value. And the reason why I'm talking about all of this stuff right, is just this thesis. If common goods create private value, and now we have the business models and the contractual infrastructure. So with the High Line, I can now create a contract between 10,000 people and share the uplift value at virtually zero overhead cost. Because I can create that contract with 10,000 people, I can put it on their title registry, on the property rights registry, property registry. At the point of sale, I can take 10% of uplift value to pay for the high line. I can do that in a completely legitimate, low cost way where the cost is near negligible. That could historically never been done. To construct a contract with 10,000 people in the old analog way would have never made this possible. So the paradigm I want to put forward is our bureaucratic technologies have radically been transformed. That marries with a comprehension that public goods create private value allows us to create a new type of value creation engine, which is no longer about the private economy, but actually is about the civic economy. And that requires a different way of looking at it. And that civic economy cannot just be around, it can be around ecological assets, it can be around shared liabilities, it can be around shared environmental, uh, environmental assets. All these things are new civic assets of the 21st century, which I think are able to be financed and organized to create the transformation that's fundamentally possible and required. And I think we have to see this perfect junction between the de democratic frame, uh, the, between the kind of civic value and the bureaucratic frame. Because keep your eye on this, Uber is a bureaucratic innovation. It, is, it, in, it re innovates bureaucracy. If you go back to the Kaiser, Kaiser constructed pretty much our current frame of bureaucracy. It was constructed through actually a machine, a military organizational model, centralization of treasury functions. These were functions that were organized largely in the 19th century. Technology is allowing us to reinvent bureaucracy, and that reinvention of bureaucracy is opening up new possibilities, and those possibilities are actually massively many to many. That many to many is a revolution in itself and opens up a new discuss discussion. And I would like to say that requires us to think not only contractually, but in accounting terms, in terms of value and how this is distributed. So who should own the uplift in property value in Amsterdam? It's an interesting question. Should it be a citizen's dividend? Because, right? Right? So should it be a dividend to all citizens? Or should it be to private houses? What is the negotiation? And all again, all I'm saying is that C property, and there's a, there's a, there's a very right-wing book called Radical Markets, but actually it's worth watching what the right are talking about in Radical Markets. They're talking about, you know, they're talking about effectively challenging uh, and recognizing property as a monopoly. Properties are a monopoly right. So even the kind of what I call far economic right, not far right, but actually people who are thinking radically about it through a market perspective, recognize this monopolistic relationship. So let's give ourselves the freedom to start to reinvent these rules and open up new discussions. And again, none of what I'm saying is, tr you know, I'm trying to say is the only truth. I could tell you about the Highline stuff because we've done the work around that. I could tell you about the tree stuff because we've done the work around that. But Actually, what I'm trying to, at a bigger level, say is there's new forms of value. Now, I've got two minutes, so I'm going to make one other point. 
The big thesis in here, so I've taken you through the granular, the big thesis or hypothesis I want to put forward to the room is this, that we are entering a new type of economic thesis which is not about private value or rivalrous economics. Our current thesis of economy is built on rivalry. I think our next thesis on, on economics has to be built on non-rivalrous economics. If you want to unlock civic data, if you want to unlock collective common goods, they are, or collective intelligence, lots of conversations going on about collective intelligence. Collective intelligence for whom? Civic data trusts for whom? If you want to unlock these new economies, they are post-rivalrous economics. Because data's value becomes ever greater, the more people add to it. The more combination, is, combination of data points that are put in, they become more valuable. So we are entering a moment where actually rivalrous economics is fundamentally out of date with the nature of how technologies are opening up a post-rivalry economy. The question is, how do we organize ourselves around it? And how do we not default to private sector monopolies of those non-rivalrous economics? Facebook gets stronger that because actually it's a monopoly and the more users they have, the, the better it gets. Right? So it's a fundamental tool that the reduction, it, it works better and better as a monopoly. So data is similar. So we're, we're increasingly reliant on a whole new class of assets that cannot be constructed through rivalrous thesis. How do we start to organize them? How do we start to operate in them? I think is going to have to require both an economic paradigm of understanding both ourselves, but also understanding new forms of value. And the thesis of non-rivalrous economics is, I think, going to be really important. Because, as somebody rightly said to me, rivalrous economics is great in a world where you didn't have nuclear bombs. Great thesis, you know, you can keep rivalry, but we are now living in a world where our global civilization is massively interdependent. So massively, whether it's in food supply chains or whether it's in mineral supply chains or potassium supply chains, massively interdependent. The idea that rivalry is a legitimate mechanism of organizing value creation could be fundamentally problematic for us as a civilization. And so have we reached a tipping point where not only are technologies demanding us to actually advance non-rivalrous economic theory, but actually the risks to us are, are saying to us, it is no longer plausible to advance our future through rivalry. Now, I put this thesis for you because it is really worth recognizing that people like Peter Thiel and the whole group of academics and thinkers and philosophers on the right have been advancing a thesis of rivalrous economics. They believe that human, that Western civilization has stopped advancing because we remove rivalry from the table. And this is why you're seeing the unbundling and the decoupling of trade rights and everything else in an economic thesis driven by the right. So if you want to build an alternative to that discourse, you are going to have to build a new narrative and a new comprehension of an alternative economic thesis which challenges that. So all I'm saying, and again, I'm not saying truth here. I'm just actually trying to open up the frames for some alternative conversations that are going to be happening over the day. So hopefully that was a little bit of an introduction, but actually the biggest, thesis, biggest point I want to make is the biggest value that's going to be created in the next 20, I would say the next 15 to 20, 25 years, if we're going to create value. And here's worth recognizing, one of the best hedge funds in Scotland, biggest hedge funds, their leader, the CEO turned around to me and said, climate change, it's a bit like, um, China multiplied by the internet. That's how valuable it will be. It will drive greater value destruction and value creation than anything else in human history. So he's, he's an interesting guy, right? This is how he's looking at it. The question is, how are we going to create that value? For whom are we going to create that value? If we're going to create it inclusively, and are we going to create it through common assets? And I would say everything is pushing us towards a new class of assets, which will be civic assets. And the question is, how do we as society organize ourselves for this new economy? Thank you. Please, uh, join me. Um Join me again. Yeah, so how are we gonna 
get a th thriving civic future. And um, of course, we were thinking, who, who, who are we going to put next to you about this topic? And we, we want to have, we don't want a debate on the functioning of the economy, because this is not an evening where we want to debate about stuff. We want to imagine uh, things. So we want to have uh, people on stage which can actually do that exercise with us. Um, uh, and we're very proud uh, of the two speakers who now, uh, who I'm now going to introduce to join this uh, conversation. And the first uh, is Ama Asante, and she's a, a very known former politician, but she's now uh, the director of the Landelijke Cliëntenraad, the, but it's the National Council Board of Clients. And what that actually means, she will uh, explain for herself. Give her a warm welcome to the stage, Ama Asante. Please. And the second person I would like to introduce to you is the founder, founder and director of Studio Zeitgeist. Give him a warm welcome to the stage, Farid Tabarki. Yeah. So, uh, what is the client, uh, what's the, the national board of clients? Um, He's working. Well, um, Actually, I'm a bit afraid to use the word client after well, <laughs> being here. What is it? What is it? Um, yeah. But um, the, 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 the Landelijke Cliëntenraad, or the National Board for Clients, my God, what a word, um, is an uh, institution uh, uh, that seeks for um, the improvement of the position of people, many Dutch citizens, uh, who for one reason or the other um, depend on collective support. Uh, and it sounds very abstract, but for uh, example, when you lose your job in the Netherlands, you know, your boss fires you and you, ha you don't have a source of income. Uh, we have a law, social security law system that uh, provides you with an income. And the work of the Landelijke Cliënterraad is actually to monitor the functionings uh, of the structures and the systems that have been set there, and especially from the perspective of the one who is depending on that system. And what we do is actually point out things that go wrong, and we make suggestions uh, at important tables where decisions are taken uh, uh, concerning all those clients, and, well, we put improvements on the table. Okay, and so. and so so you said okay after being here for in this in this discussion now you think oh, any of course that words are important and you, you're not oh, clients yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's horrible yeah <laughs> the word client um, is 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 horrible because why do I become a client when I am depending on social security. Why am I a client? Am I buying something? Am I consuming something? And it's problematic for me because I think that all of us have been uh, laid to bed, put to sleep by uh, a system that has been, uh, it's not a system that was there yesterday or today, but it has a system that has been you know, constructed or not, no, structurally built um, based on the idea that it is better for all of us uh, when we do away with collectivism and we put individualism on the front. And we call them clients of a service. And we call them client of a service. It comes out of this ideology of individualism, uh, we have those horrible words in the Netherlands, eigen kracht, self-regie, and I will translate it for you. Uh, my own power, uh, 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 my um, self-regie, how do I say that in English? Self-directing, you know, self-supporting, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Yes, okay, that was just the introduction question, yes. Uh, and for those who don't know what uh, Studio Zeitgeist is, is Farid, what, what do you do? 
Uh, we try to explore what the future is uh, is in hold of us. So we try to see what are the, the current developments and how should we think about the development when you think about what it means for society, what it means for organizations, what it means for individuals, and how do we give, give leadership to this new phenomenon that also India is, is describing really well. Yeah, and one of the notions you, you put to the table is that the middle is disappearing. What do you mean with that? Yeah, so so one of the theories we work with is is uh, the liquid society. Uh, it's borrowed from C Baumann, uh, a fellow Polish British citizen. Um, uh, he died two years ago and he wrote a book uh, called Liquid Modernity. And he tries to think about what happens after modernity, the current age, and he tries to predict that we're going to a liquid modernity. And he's a philosopher, so that's a very philosophical book, but we use his theory of liquid modernity to what does it mean for the society, what does it mean for organizations, for et cetera, et cetera. Well, what it means for society is one thing, is if there's no hierarchy anymore, right? not, 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 because not, that's, the, that's the idea, there well, is no hierarchy. If, if things become liquid, of course, and you get, you get horizontal connections, it's easier to connect, but also to disconnect. So, uh, so what, what do you get as society? Well, society is now structured industrial, there's a top, there's a middle, there's, there's, there's a bottom in, in, in our economies, in our industries, in our, in our, in our, in our schools, etc., etc. And in a liquid society, these things shift, of course. So there's no natural middle position anymore in our societies, meaning difficult ages for our middle-income jobs, uh, difficult things for our nation-state, being in the middle of the international organizations and a more decentralized way of having our cities, uh, but also um, uh, in Dutch, middenstands, uh, the retail uh, sector, uh, the heart of our our uh, villages, of our cities where we come together, um, are also now vanishing because of new technology. So this whole exploration of this theory, I tried to put into this book, The End of the Middle, which I proudly presented here on this stage a couple of years ago. Okay, so, and now, and now, and now we are trying to find, reimagine um, institutions, we, we invent or even invent uh, institutions or um, think of ideas that bring us further in solving these enormous challenges we have. And of course, in the introduction of this little uh, block on uh, thriving, um, uh, uh, Indy is proposing a new idea of value and a new relationship between the public and the private. Yeah. Did, uh, what, what kind of associations or explorations happened in your head mm -hmm. when you heard this introduction? Um. Um, many, um, <laughs> many, and and I I think I agree um, uh, with what you have said that we have to rethink, you know, uh, the whole concept of what is a private domain and what is the public domain, and it will automatically lead us to question uh, a concept such as value. Um, in my work, and I'm bringing it back to my yes. reality. Um, one of the, uh, uh, the biggest challenges that I face is actually that I am saying that we are living in the Netherlands and we have a political leadership uh, uh, that, you know, the past, let me say, 12 years at least, um, um, has introduced this idea that there is no ideology behind what they are doing. You know, there's no vision. Actually, our prime minister is constantly criticized by the fact that he has no vision. Uh, I think it's a lie. You know, I think that... He said it in his speech. <laughs> he said, everybody wants me to have a vision on the world. But I think that is, that is a stupid question to me. I don't want to have a vision. Well, okay. I think it is a lie. And I'm, uh, I'm taking the example of our social security or benefit system to point out that it is a lie. Because behind this system, there is this ideology... Uh, you know, that uh, work, for example, pays off. Because when you work, then you can earn an income. Uh, so there is a lot of value put on work. And I'm not saying that working, it's not important. But uh, the other side of it is that when you do not work, whether it's your own fault or not. You have I, no value. You have no value. Yeah. You have no value. And because you have no value, uh, value, and all of us have accepted this idea, we think that uh, it is correct that before you can receive social benefits, we need to put certain conditions on the table. And if you do not uh, uh, fit 
in those conditions, then you do not have the right of social benefit. And I call it conditioned solidarity. And I think it's quite problematic because, um, you know, today I might be a lucky girl, you know, I have a job, I have a house, I can pay my mortgage, my kids can, you know, do all kinds of stuff and, and sports that they like. We go on holidays and, you know, if I'm not careful, I can think that this is all because of my doing, that there is no collective you know, reason behind or at the basis of where I'm standing today. So if anything goes wrong, then it is my mistake. And it is a lie, it is not true. Like you said, if I imagine myself of being a queen, where I come from, then I come to realize that me is actually we, it is us. So I want to argue this whole concept of conditional solidarity that all of us in the Netherlands, we have bought it, you know, and we have allowed ourselves to be put in bed with this idea. And so if you would imagine an alternative institution, mm -hmm. what would you imagine? If I imagine an alternative institution, I would imagine an institution that is not built on our gross national product, but it is an institution that is built on our gross national product. Uh, geluk, how happiness. Do you, happiness, and it's not a new idea at all, totally not. Uh, but I think that we should redefine uh, uh, um, what is of value, and what is of value, it's not economic production uh, and work, what is of value is happiness. Mm, nice, Mr. Um, I totally agree. I, I think this is where it gets into some really interesting but detailed conversations. So one, there was a really brilliant piece of work done by um, a foundation in the UK, which asked people that were suffering from obesity, you know, what, why, why, why are you suffering? Most of them blamed themselves, said, it's my fault. It's my fault. And that's because we've constructed a situation that actually the only agency and blame is to, to the individual. Whereas actually the reality was they were living in obesogenic environments. Environments that were biased towards actually their lack of mobility, bad food, bad environment, psychological stress, which people don't talk about, huge amount of conditions. But we've constructed a narrative and, a, and an ideal, ideological narrative which constructs the situation around the individual. And the second thesis or hypothesis, we, we, in fact, actually this is, there's a lot of evidence around, if you want to motivate anyone, right, anyone in your organization, many of you work in organizations, financial incentives after about 40,000-ish euros, nominal, nominal. Actually what is far more powerful is, I think you're amazing, man. I think what you do is brilliant. No, but really, it, and it's true. Emotional actual recognition, human recognition, is a significantly more advantageous and more powerful reward. Not, not in a cynical sense, in a deep sense. But- There's been a, done a lot of research that if you pay people after, they make I mean, about 40,000 euros, and you say, if you do this really well, you get 1,000 euros. Uh, they don't really doesn't do, work. doesn't, doesn't work, work because you already have 40,000, so there's no marginal effect. And that's what you're saying, exactly. the rewards. Yeah. So what this starts to say is that actually, but from a, fun, from a CFO perspective, I can put down bonuses and reward mechanisms yeah. on an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. What I can't do is put down, hey, I think you're amazing. So the question is we already know, and the fact is we already know, in organizing societies, actually financial incentives are the means of organizing uh, what I would, and this is where I become slightly contentious sort or of difficult, but almost like the quasi-slaved mechanisms. If you use, can use money to organize people, you're moving actually their base reality. Whereas if you want to move their top most purposeful reality, it's not how you do it. And then the question really comes to the table. What economy do you want to build in Amsterdam? Yeah. Do you want to build the base economy 
where actually I control you with small incentives, i.e. small behaviors, or do you want to build the massively cognitive surplus, rich, purposeful economy? That will not be motivated by money, nor will it be created by money. But that's, right. yeah, but, but and th th that's, I think, the great thing about this evening, and, and your agenda maybe for, for, for probably next year, or you've been doing these de debates for a, for a longer time, is that also in your discourse, uh, it is about purpose. You're, you use the word purposeful. Uh, we used to think about products, about clients, all these industrial uh, names we were building up our society up on. And now the question becomes, uh, if you talk about how do you organize it? Well, if we want to do, do the how, we also have to know what the purpose is of doing this. Mm -hmm. What's the purpose? Uh, what's my purpose of my, 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 my well-being? Which may be a different well-being than your well-being, which is fine. But now we have a system which creates one well-being for everybody because it's a one-size-fits-all system. And now we go into a one-size-does-not-fit-all system in every sense. When it comes to education, when it comes to health, when it comes to the city uh, that we believe in. There's not one city that we all want to be part of. There are many different different cities within these cities, we have to facilitate. And that's why I think this deliberative uh, democracy uh, discussion is very important, because it's about us finding out, we finding out, what we find important on, on the national, on the local level, and between the different networks that we can create nowadays. Thanks also to technology, because if, uh, there's one discussion on this, the concrete city level, but also outside the city level, because if you're discussing, well, how do we create surplus um, and how do, how, how do we distribute it, why only with the people in the, within the city of Amsterdam? I mean, this is the capital, we earn a lot of money, why don't you distribute it to a larger audience? Which are, of course, philosophical questions we can't get concrete into, but that's, of course, one of the questions that we can uh, discuss. Yeah, and so if you would uh, um, uh, reimagine some uh, an institution, what, because it, within the context of your liquid society uh, frame, if you look at the world like that, what kind of institutions sh should we reimagine or imagine? Um, well, I have a difficulty with the word, in word institution. Okay. Uh, let's start with that. Yeah. Um, no, because, because because I don't think there's one... Uh, I mean, again, I think we're now using frames of one-size-fits-all, one new educational system, one way of, of governing our cities. I think there are multiple systems uh, uh, possible and capable of, of, of creating welfare for our city and for our citizens. So I think it's about distributing this power and distributing uh, different tasks on, on different times, whatever the need is of these people. So we're th thinking about something which is way more dynamic than building one new infrastructure for the 21st century. I think that's a very old-fashioned way of thinking. Yeah. Well, when I hear you say <clears throat> the word <clears throat> distribution, then um, I think that what we need to do, even before we can come to a discussion about redistribution, is acknowledging that the current system uh, uh, really is not functioning anymore. And I will use a very practical example. How come that in the Netherlands, we find it very normal that the government will spend 250,000 euros to help a family with a debt of 50,000 euros, and at the end of it, the family is still left with the debt. That is what is happening actually in our current economy. It is weird. It's happening, we know it's happening, and yet we still accept it. When are we going to question the Next system <laughs> that <laughs> creates this insanity? It's insane. <laughs> Yeah, really? <laughs> Next week, Emma is on the stage because we're going to talk about this massive injustice in the schulden, uh, in the debt situation of all these households in the Netherlands. Uh, so welcome uh, uh, to everybody. But yeah, you're saying this is the economic system we now create is that because we think it's your fault, as in the, exactly. in the obe obe uh, uh, obese situation, uh, example of uh, Mr. Yor, it's your fault you're in a debt. So now... You have uh, to bleed you have to bleed, but we now, But we also have responsibility for the well-being of your children, so we sent a professional caretaker to, this, to the family. Uh, we also, you're also much sicker now, so we sent you a psych psych psychiatrist to the, to the family. We give you medicine for anxiety. We give you, sent you to the doctor because of high blood pressure. 
pressure. And we have all this, and this amounts to the 100, 250,000 euro of social investment we do in the family, but we do not solve the debt of 40,000. Yeah, but if you want to imagine something, and this is also what India has been stressing, how, how do people get into debt? I mean, mm -hmm. how can we be pre preventive? So, uh, so, mm -hmm. so I'm totally in favor of, of changing the system, the current system, which is not about collective, collective responsibility, but individual responsibility of all these different agencies never working together. Mm -hmm. But if you think about the coming decade and, and, and the possibilities India is showing us, is how do we prevent these things? How we can have mm -hmm. collective systems which, which make sure that people don't get into debt, don't, don't mm -hmm. become sick, because this is possible with all these new uh, possibilities. And I think that India is showing also possibilities that we can actually get there if we have the right instruments and the right organizing principles of what we base our society upon when it comes to openness, when it comes to creating networks, when it comes to creating a purpose of why you do it. Because if you have the right purpose, you would never have these people in debt in the first place. Because you, it, it can be done, it can't be done if the purpose is right and we have the instruments for making sure this purpose is, is being rightfully mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. I, th I, th I think it's exactly, I mean, as all of you are saying, the same thing applies to homelessness. Mm -hmm. The cost of being homelessness is about 38 to 40,000 euros. To give someone a home is about 12 to 15,000, maybe a little bit more. The fact that we don't do it is economic madness in a simple form, but it's built on an ideology. And yeah. this is where I think you're absolutely right, which is that we have to not create, I think there's a proper word for this, which is um, uh, you, you don't want to create an incentive to everyone to sort of want a free home. So this yeah. is, it comes from an idea. The free rider effect. The free rider. Yeah. The free rider effect, exactly. Now the question is, how much of society is actually an uh, opt opter into a free rider effect? Say it's three to 5%, let's say. Now this is a thesis. If it's three to five percent is a free rider effect, what is the benefit to the other 93 percent that don't have to worry? Suddenly, you have 93 to 94 percent of the population that don't have to worry and actually are liberated to do something extraordinary. So we target ourselves from seeing the worst possible behaviors, yeah. not accentuating exactly. the yeah. possibility on the other side. And again, we already know it is not about the penalties, it's about the social incentives on the other side of the table, yeah. which are actually about social recognition. So how do we rebuild our new models of social recognition for value that is created in the civic domain on the other side? So we, our incentive systems are really biased. We're using very small lenses and we're all using on the penalitive side and actually there are other mechanisms in society yeah. that we could rebalance our incentives model yeah. around society. Thank you. So, so I'm going to cl uh, close off this part of the, the conversation, but it's really interesting for me. It's added something, uh, the notion that it's not one size fits all, of course, be because you give democratic rights to create your own future institutions and it's going to be a, a, a palette, a, a mosaic of different uh, institutions which actually help the benefit of those who need them, right? And the other notion, of course, is that that even in our most, uh, uh, well, beautiful institutions like we think of as a society to have a landelijke cliënteraad, <laughs> uh, because we need those people on the table, they need to be represented, we want to hear their voice, but we use frames in which uh, you actually put them uh, uh, yeah. In a, in a specific construct towards power. I acknowledge. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, thank you so much for this uh, beautiful conversation. Farita Barti, Ama Asante. Yeah. For diegenen die de tijd in de ga oh, for those who look at the watch, yeah, it's uh, half past. So we have a third round, and I'm looking at the audience whether you are like, but I think it's still going okay, right? Yeah, so let's go to the third part of the urban provocation. And now we're going to talk about towards a democratic civic future. Of course, the, the, the most, I think, most well, important democracy and democratic institutions have been mentioned before. The third round in Johar. So um, you're probably getting tired of my voice. So, uh, <laughs> so I think one of the big questions that we face is in order to do the scale of change that we're doing and we need to do, how do we create this civic legitimacy? How do we construct this legitimacy? I'm going to give you an example of an experiment that we ran around universal basic income uh, at, uh, in the hub. Now, we were 
we invited people, literally off the street, to have a conversation with us. And we asked them their opinion of who thinks universal basic income is a good idea and a bad idea. Right? This is just first thing, first opinion. What we got was 73% of people said it was a bad idea. 28, 27% thought it was a good idea. That's the proportion. 70% of people said there was a, a free rider problem that everyone else would get lazy and do nothing. Right? We took them into a room and we said, right, you're all here together. And we gave them access to some resources and we said, have a debate about what you think the issues are. You can research online. And we gave them eight hours to have internal conversations. At the end of that, we asked them their opinion and what they thought whether universal basic income was good or bad. Guess what? It had completely flipped. 70 odd percent, 72 percent said it was a good idea, and 28 percent said it was a bad idea. Now, what that showed us, and there's lots of other studies which show this, is that how you ask questions fundamentally changes the nature of the answers you get. Right? If you want to construct a particular type of response, you ask for opinion. And I would argue the biggest challenge we face is we're constructing our democracy through opinion as opposed to deliberation. And the deliberation is not about intelligent people, the smartest people deliberating. It is about everyday people deliberating. And I think we have a soft uh, prejudice that we think the people every day can't deliberate this stuff. I often get, you know, get told, Indy, your language is so difficult. And I was like, you know what? I've been in rooms after seven hours. Nobody's worrying about my language. Because actually what people are thinking about is the concepts and the words and why they mean what they mean to them. So the thesis I want to put down is if we're going to drive change at the scale that we're going to have to do, it cannot be done through opinions. It will have to be constructed through deliberation. And that scale has to be done at, at, at speed. How do you do that? How does a brilliant institution like this, brilliant institutions like VARG, brilliant, brilliant institutions around here, how do you have a new type of civic conversation in Amsterdam at the speed that we need to have it to talk about creating the legitimacy of change? Because it is not that politicians are not good. Actually, most politicians would like to do this stuff, but they need the politics constructed. And the construction of the politic is, I think, the fundamental task. And unless we can create the deliberative frameworks, we will get locked in by opinion-driven frameworks. And I would argue the reason why we have the current thesis going around the world is because it's constructed through opinion, which is operating thinner and thinner through emotional level responses to questions, emotive level responses. So if you look at any of the Cambridge Analytics stuff, if you look at any of the Trump campaigns, if you look at the Brexit campaign, it is driving a discourse through visceral psychological opinions, opinions that are constructed on a base. Let me explain the base here. The base is this. If you make people precarious, it's a, sorry, it's a really clunky word. Precarious is if you make people vulnerable. And you can make people vulnerable by taking away their labor rights. You can make people vulnerable by putting them in debt. You can make people vulnerable by making them um, sort of uh, psychologically fearful of the future. Right? When you construct this stuff, when you construct this economic reality, you create people a psychological mindset of precariousness. Now, in recessions, what do you think happens? We've, there's lots of economic research which says when, you are, when an economy goes through recessions, what do people do? They go to the hairdressers, they go to get their nails done, they buy chocolate, they buy short level psychological goods. They buy short term psychological goods that actually reinforce their reality. They are prevented from thinking long term, right? This is called 
the, I mean, I would call this the economic neuroscience of society. You create the economic conditions to shift the neuroscience of society. What we have done in most of the kind of Anglo-Saxon economies have constructed precariousness and on that are now using opinion mechanisms, which means that we are operating through a very thin, shallow opinion focused lens. At the same time, since the 1970s, so 1980s in the UK, when we got rid of Sunday trading laws, so you could open up trading in Sundays, we've got rid of community groups, we've got rid of uh, public uh, community spaces, they've all been eradicated because we've replaced community goods with consumer retail relationships. So when you put all this together, what you construct is a destruction of the deliberative space of democracy. You construct um, uh, technologies like Facebook and other things, making it really effective to be able to construct mass opinion. And at the same time, you've created the economic conditions to drive people to precarious fear-based models and vulnerable to opinion-based models of thinking. So, in that thesis, we've created actually everything that is destructive for making deep, complex decisions, which is what we are facing as societies. So, the art of rebuilding democracy is not what people say, which is just about voter turnout. You know, the constant debate, let's get the young out, right? There's something deeper going on here that if we only can, we need to start having real conversations with ourselves about how we do it. And my big thing here is the format changes the result. The medium is the message. You want opinions, you'll get a completely different type of response. You construct deliberative debate, you will get a completely different type of response. So the politics is in the construction of the medium not just in the construction of the, uh, of the question. What does that do for our construction of democracy? So if Amsterdam wants to build the 21st century democratic institutions, how do you have a thousand conversations in the street to actually build a climate change strategy which is built with a thousand different conversations, which actually builds the civic infrastructure and the civic legitimacy for the scale of change? Because if we don't, then the change will happen either top-down through an authoritarian leader, leadership, violently, or it will not happen and we will see the slow degradation or fast degradation of all our institutions around us. So finding this mechanism, I think, is key. I'm not saying I know what it is, but all I do know is that there are, the formats change the result of the conversations and the outcomes. So the question is, how do we build this deliberative space to having these sort of conversations? And also, how do we have the space, the grammar and the syntax, to have debate together in a way which isn't about putting someone down or saying someone's opinion is non-relevant, but actually having the, having the framework to open up and see new possibilities. With that, I end. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. And um, let's, uh, let's open the conversation with two uh, guests, we have we ask many times on the stage here at Pakas because we're so fond of their thinking. Uh, even though one of the speakers is actually also being on the stage tomorrow, I saw on the website. <laughs> Good. Now, uh, the first one is uh, the founder and director of uh, WAG already. WAG, he mentioned it uh, as, as an example of civic leadership in this city. Marlene Sticker. <laughs> Oh. Yeah. And, um, and the other per person is actually a politician. Um, uh, nothing wrong with politicians, of course. Uh, she is the district chairman in Amsterdam, Zuidoost, Tanja Jadanansing. Yeah. Um, Mevrouw Jadna Nansing, laten we begin... Oh, let's start. Yes. Um, so, it's not about what, what is wrong or right. It's about imagining new ways. And, and the, the urgency of the question is big because uh, Mr. Yower is proposing the thesis that we need much more deliberative discussions. And, 
I heard in the audience, what is it, what is it exactly? So what's the difference between opinion and deliberation? Uh, and deliberation is based on arguments and facts, and then discussing that, why do you think that? This is my argument, okay, I would propose this argument, okay, let's see if there is an expert or a fact which we can use, and that process, so the example of these people in the room with computers where they could access data, is an example of a deliberative process, so arguments and facts as the base, base for a discussion. That's, and that is also in, the, yeah, in, do you have a mic? The, the, the only thing I would add is that yeah. actually it's not, it, people often focus on the discussion, mm -hmm. and actually what it is is the empathy. Yes, understanding and, why the other is posing the argument. Exactly, argue. and it's the f understanding that someone who is different oh. actually is also, um, uh, it's understanding having a relationship with the other, which is less about distancing and so you become familiar yes. so the person is not a free rider that person you thought was going to be lazy isn't going to be lazy mm -hmm. and that is what makes the cognitive leap possible so it's not even the facts no. it's actually the social relationships that, which is, construct that are that built yeah and you need so you need longer time to get that exactly. you need to get to know each other okay so and so and we need that deliberation he talks about a thousand conversations in the streets of Amsterdam uh, um, what do you think about this, this notion of that we need to reimagine democracy in this way? Yeah, well, um, let me say at first that um, it was the first time that I had to come up to this stage with, and um, I emailed with Pakhuis de Zwijger with Charlie about, I think, a thousand times because I told her and I was laughing when you said that people find you quite difficult in how you speak and I told Charlie then, who is this man and he's way too difficult for me. I don't want to be with him on stage because I think, wow, he's Out up there. there really abstract and I'm like really concrete. But then I heard you and I was like, I can do this because, um, yeah, actually, because um, for one example, I have a committee of children. I have a little me, she's 12 years old. She is the chairman of Amsterdam Southeast but she's 12 and she's my partner in crime. And we uh, have these uh, debates, which are not debates, they are, I think, more the kind of thing you want. Deliberative um, discussion. That one, yeah. and um, I, cannot, I cannot pronounce that. I cannot. Uh. Okay, so um, that's actually, I learned that from the kids also. They said to me, we have to be authentic. So if I think, find things difficult, I can come up stage and say I find it difficult. And if I think I cannot pronounce a word, I can say I cannot pronounce that word. I learned that from the kids. But we have this um, rule. When we come to debate with each other, we have this rule which is called LEF. And LEF is courage. like courage, but it stands for listening, luisteren, empathy, empathy, and um, feedback. And all the time we come together, we have these three things which we bring into the debate. And you get a whole different conversation. And we use facts, we, use, we have computers in the boardroom at that moment, and they can just go and look up things. And this Wednesday, we are opening up a, a garbage can which can talk. Because these, these kids came up with the idea. They said, you know, we have this problem in Amsterdam Southeast. We have a lot of garbage all over. And they said, okay, what can, how can we solve this problem? And they said, it should be fun. Problems can be solved when we put in a fun solution. And he said, what if we have this garbage can which talks, but should be in the 170 languages we have in Amsterdam Southeast? because we have 170 nationalities. And I said, okay, this is quite a task. Let's start with 10. And he said, mm, you are boring, but okay, we'll start with 10. So next Wednesday, we'll have this talking garbage can. You throw, up, you throw your garbage in it, and it will say, thank you, Dani Bhat. It will say, uh, muchas gracias, and those languages. And my point is that I must, I thought you would be way too abstract for me, but then again, again, it's really concrete what you are telling us, because I think that you're quite right. If we really want to change democracy, 
it has to be in a total different way. And I find it really inspiring to talk to kids about how do we go about with this democracy idea. But I also think that what you are saying that, you know, let's ask ourselves other questions. Let's um, think out of boxes. Um, but I really have to ask you, how do I say this to my colleagues tomorrow? <laughs> the, the other politicians, how do I go about this? Okay, guys, you know what? From today on, we'll just, we don't debate anymore. We'll, have that other deliber deliberation. I can do it. Deliberation. <laughs> Please help me out. I think, um, I, firstly, you're wiser than me on this question, and yeah. I'm not a politician, so I wouldn't know, but yeah. my intuition right now is that if you look at the scale of what's required, I think the urgency doesn't need to come from you or me. Mm -hmm. The urgency is coming from the world. And I think we have to make ourselves accountable to the change that's required, mm. not actually to your or I needs. Mm. And I think that is what I, I think we have to put squarely on the table. The scale of transition required. I, you know, I'll talk about, you know, we, we, we were sitting with one UK government agency, I won't name them. Um, but they were about the environment? Or? No, they were transportation. <laughs> A big government agency. And they said, we have all the policies, yet nothing is really prepared for 2030. Mm. So all the policy rhetoric has been done. We're going to be carbon neutral, we're going to be lighter. The mayors have signed up to everything. But if you technically look at actually the transition required towards it, and the bureaucratic forms that have to be reimagined, actually how we're allocating, none of the actual stuff is on the table. And so I think there is a, and, the, and this was them being honest, right? They were saying, this is the reality. Yeah. Policy rhetoric is moving this fast. Our ability to transform is not there. And I think, I, I think there's a way to have this conversation without making people feel blamed or at fault. Yeah. And I think that's the conversation. Yeah. We have to yeah. alleviate making people say, you are terrible for not doing it. Yeah. Actually, we have to do this together. And I think, I don't know, so that would be my intuition. Yes. Maybe, just to close it up, but maybe I will start with this uh, we exercise tomorrow yeah. in the meeting. I think that would be a great start. Yeah. Yeah. And, to, to, and also to explain that you, you're the embodiment of all yeah. that stardust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's beautiful. Yeah. I, can you make a film of that yeah, and share it with us? Yes. yes. Amazing. <laughs> Thanks. I will, uh, I will make that film. Uh, and send it to me, and I'll yeah. send it to everybody here. Yeah. Um, um, Marlene Sticker, um, uh, already for uh, a long time now, reimagining institutions, of course, uh, also here in the Netherlands, um, on the digital, but very much on the economic, the commoning discussion we have, um, and also on the democratic side of the debate, or the discussions we have. Um, if you could radically imagine new initiatives, institutions we need for the urgent matters we have to solve? What would be the first, which, which, what's the first thing that comes to mind in imagining that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just a bit, yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm totally, f um, I don't know. Um, the moment that you start to talk about the scale of urgency, I. What happens? How, how, how are we going to do this, really? Yeah. Because, because you're proposing not only that people have to rethink their language in a way that we define things, that we also have to understand that actually by giving it certain words and concepts, we define the world around us. Mm. Which is, I'm, and this is something that I'm also expressing a lot when we talk about technology, that the technology is, we, we, we make these technologies, but then they make us. So, so it's... But it's it, an interaction the, between. It's an interaction yeah. which sort of sets us in in, in a for, is formatting us. It's, so you're, a lot of what you're saying is that we need to change the spreadsheet, and 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 but the ones who are keeping the spreadsheet are desperate in keeping the spreadsheet uh, to sustain the spreadsheet as it is. Yes. Um, and um, so that's also why I, in my conclusion of wanting to. To, to, to regain sovereignty in the digital, you have to 
have to think about what is economy and how is value being defined and what is actually money. This is the discussion tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And what is then, well, sustainable finance, I think this is the wrong thing. It's how can we make civic money or how we can rethink money. And so, and, and so there, I also come to the whole conclusion that we have to rethink economics and reclaim economics. And well, then the general conception of next to the market, we have to think about the personal household and we have to think about the state, of course, but we also have to think about the commons as, as the shared resource. And I think this view that the planet is a shared resource, that that maybe we ourselves now are shared resource, I don't, I don't know, share, For do sure, I share my share, own resources? Yeah, you <laughs> share with all kinds of micro, I know now, it's I have uh, a lots one, of one animals. I kilo on microorganisms in myself, yeah, so exactly. I'm definitely a we. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know. Dinner. We don't even know what's actually m constituting our uh, emotions, yeah. uh, because it could be the microorganisms in me um, that's now talking. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! I'm getting really very confused. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's the whale in myself. I don't know, or the, the, the sea that's that's talking through me. I don't know. Um, so yes, we have to do the imagination. <laughs> Maybe it's the time of the evening. Sorry. Uh, no, the, the, we have to reconceptualize so many different, so many different things at and the then, same time. Yeah, and there's in a so very many, short time. In a very short time, and there are so, such immense power structures uh, inside of the constitutions that we have. So if you think about democracy, I think it, it, we definitely uh, have to. We don't have to be angry about represent, representative democracy because they can't help it, you can't help it mm, to be in the system. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, it, so I'm not saying that it's, it's bad or it's wrong, but we have to think about civic democracy. I think this is also what Cenk Willing has been uh, presenting yeah. here, is this whole yeah. concept of, of what we, we... Politics derives its legitimacy from society. So we have to we reconstitute society and understand what civic responsibility means and, and how cooperation, what cooperation can mean, and that definitely needs to ha involve all the things that you have said. So I think that's really great. Um, I also practice uh, slow thinking or dialogue, um, and um, I, 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 uh, that's an, also one of those formats, you can say, is Socratic dialogue. And then I chair a table with 15, 20 people. You can do it with kids and anybody. And then one of the, there were some rules, and one of them, one of the basic rules is that there is no authority outside of what's on the table. I think this is a little bit common what we think, what what you also said. Yeah. So it is not. You can say, well, uh, a very important person told us. It's just what you can constitute and produce at the table at the moment. That's why this methodology is called Socratic, because he's the one who thinks that all the knowledge is inside of us. So you bring this, the knowledge that you already have on the table. Which, and then one of another very important rules is that you just don't start to talk. You have to ask to talk. And that you are always able to repeat what the last speaker said. And that is great. Because that makes people start to listen. Mm -hmm. And you really have okay, to I have slow to, down. I have to repeat it. I have to repeat it. <laughs> yeah. 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 So instead of what's happening yeah. In, yeah. in our own brain, yeah. at the moment that somebody talks, I think, ah, yeah. And then, then you start to constitute your own, uh, uh, well, what you want to say. Yeah. And then you start, st you stop listening. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, so I think this kind of, um, to, to learn, to, 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 to build this capacity, we have to do that in a very early stage. And this is not what the educational system is doing at the moment. So we have to reform, I don't know where to start. I mean, we have to start everywhere at the same time. So I think it's great that you're doing these kids, but schools at the moment should really build this capacity. And, and so that means that our teachers have to build this capacity. Uh, but then we also have to get the, the, the competition out of schools. So we have to have this whole idea that you can be very smart or very stupid. At eight years old, we already make people feel miserable because they're stupid. They're not smart enough. So what, 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 what then happens afterwards is that people... And then you say, please think. And, uh, well, and, uh, well, you, you just say, you can't think. Yeah. You go do something with your hands. You're not ca capable of, of, of par being part of the... Yeah. Deli not even, I don't even know how to express this. Deliber Delib Deliberative. <laughs> yeah. Deliberative. See, it's, it's we need a Dutch word yeah. for this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But so, so a lot of people feel uh, excluded from the discourse. Yeah. 
And so then they are angry that they're not part of this course. Yeah. And then, of course, you, you activate the opinionated, uh, emotional, um, so like, like almost the, the, the dependency on the, the, the fast kick of, of having effect because you say something nasty. And a lot of people are at the moment um, in this loop, in this neurological loop that they feel good when, they, uh, when people are angry. Mm-hmm. And when they are self, they're angry. So they, they get the, what, the, dependent on their angriness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so there are a lot of d- difficult things here. One of the most important things to me is how to change this spreadsheet. Mm-hmm. And how, and so this is, can be that, and I'm, I'm really troubled in my head, do we have to put the trees and the whales on the balance? Or is this the wrong way to go? So that we should, so this is like, are we repair, if, if we want to make, is this the first horizon to put everything which has not a voice, to put it as fast as pos- possible on the balance sheet, so that all the, all the, the numbers change? But then on, this, on the other side, I think we don't want to have everything being finalized. Uh, uh, this, this is also part of the finalization. That's another English word. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. <laughs> uh, which to put I numbers and value not and to. money on it. Yeah. So these are some of the problems I, 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 I see. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and all of this, because if somebody says we need to change education, I'm like, okay, yeah. Um, well, I, can, I can say what we do ourselves. And, 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 and this is, so we, we do teach the teachers, uh, bring uh, um, a lot of teachers in to learn, to unlearn them that they have to know everything. Yeah. And that they start to understand that they can learn together with their children and yeah. their students and their pupils. Yeah. Um, this is the start, so to unlearn what you have learned yourself yes. mm-hmm. and to open yourself for, the, for a, a more invent to learn a, a, a process where you yeah. make stuff. I've, what I missed in the whole discussion yeah. at the moment is the term design. I think um, I've been asked to, 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 to participate in this. Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. I think if, if we want to help politicians, they have and to get them out of their opinionated. Um, Ecosystem, ecosystem of competition, of, yeah. of competition yeah. of, of, of us voting for them. We have to bring in the notion of that we can make and design and collaborate on the future. Mm-hmm. Yes, and then co-create, all these political parties are co-create all, all the, all all the, all the fancy stuff, but it yeah. can also be very simple in, yeah. in, in, in finding new ways to, to work together. Yeah, and of course that is if you say we need five thousand conversations on the streets of on the future of, you mean processes where Marlene is talking about, with, where the form is not per, per se a deliberative process with eight hours, but using all these inspirations, for instance, from design to co, co-decide, co-create, co-produce, make and, and solutions. Yeah, maybe I can just put in a little example. I was a little bit late in this meeting because I came from a debate which we had in Amsterdam Southeast. We have a huge problem there at the moment, which is an increasing uh, violence. We have a lot of violence in our in our uh, neighborhoods, and um, I could think by myself that we could solve it with politicians. But then I was like, no. What if all the uh, residents would come in and they would organize debates themselves? So we have had a lot of debates the last uh, month. We had three marshes. Mar- uh, f- against violence, um, and we had um, we built safety tents. So there were tents in all of the neighborhoods, and people could just co- could come in and they could talk about how they see the uh, the, the violence and how we could uh, solve this. And this um, this evening we had a. D- debate totally organized by citizens themselves, the residents. It was packed, it was, there, weren't, there weren't chairs enough, it was all packed. But what they did was they um, said, we are not going to do it by uh, the standard debate way, which I would do. They said, we will just sit down with each other first, we'll eat together first, and then after that, will get up on stage and will have provocations like you did. And um, so the whole, the, whole, the whole sphere, it changed. And um, well, I had this appointment here, so I had to leave. But it was one of the most inspiring 
evenings I've seen in a long time. Beautiful. And it's that what if I was, ima I reimagined, now I'm just, you know, it's, it, I did it like just naturally, but now I can put it into words, thanks to you. Thanks to you, I, I reimagined that what if I would not be the person who says we should have this debate? What if citizens themselves would do it? What if I just gave all the control to them? And it was a wonderful evening with, a, I think, a lot of solutions will be, and it will be theirs. So I don't have to tell them you have to do this because they themselves said we are going to do this. My, now and now you know uh, Tanya, but now Indy knows, and now the entire room know, knows why we wanted you on stage. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, please. No, I I yes. totally uh, I think that's amazing, and I I. I I think one of the things I suppose I want to come back to is, I think Marlene, Marlene's point here about speed and the scale of change. Okay, final thoughts. And I suppose where I'd come to on this is that in 1939, the whole of European economy was changed by the advent of war. Every industry, every relationship, humans were redeployed. It is not increasingly in our lived memory that human society can be transformed very quickly. Yeah, radically. Radically. Yeah. And I think if you look at the scale of change, we need to give ourselves permission to be able to do pretty radical things very quickly. Yeah. And I hate using the analogy of war. It is a crappy analogy because it also creates authoritarianism at the center of it. But if you understand the speed and you marry it with deliberation, how could those things come together to open up a new possibility of transformation? I have fundamental belief that in our desire to actually save ourselves and save our future, we can do this. I think that it's possible and it's necessary. And now the question is, how do we start to do it? And I do think you're right about the spreadsheet. And I do think you're right that there are lots of people absolutely vested in holding the spreadsheet to the current standards. But I also believe that if one place transforms, it will transform like a virus across everywhere else. Because everywhere else wants this possibility. And I go back to this hedge fund manager who said, this transformation in the next 10 years is more powerful than China multiplied by the internet in terms of value creation. So if the capital economy sees this as a foundational transformation opportunity, I think we should see it also. And the question is, how do we create this as a civic capital future as opposed to just a hedge fund future for everyone, for a few, for the 1%. That, I think, is the opportunity, but I also think it's a necessity. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, this thank, was you. Uh, thank you, Marlene Sticker. Thank you so much. Uh, please, please um, uh, and then a final very big thank you to our special guest of our opening night, Indy Johar. Thank you. Um, can, I just say, can I just say one thing? Uh, he wants one more minute. W one second. I oh, just second. Want, I really want to thank everyone for your patience in hearing me in English because I have no Dutch capability. So I want to thank everyone and uh, to actually having the patience to listen to me in English and actually all the amazing speakers because actually that was a privilege for you to be able to speak to me in this language. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Dear audience of, of Pakhuis, we hope to see you uh, many times the coming season. This was just an introduction to hopefully more programs where we're going to imagine new institutions. Um, we always ask the programmers to select some things which maybe you find interesting. Coming Thursday, we're going to talk about the value of green and also should we monetize uh, things like that, the value of green. Um, on uh, the same night, you can talk, we get, we, we're going to talk about democratic innovations. 
uh, in our democracy uh, with a guest from Madrid. Uh, Friday, the next day, we're going to talk about the Black Atlantic, about black identity in urban culture in Africa and America. And I already mentioned this one. Next week, we're going to reimagine a different system for dealing with people in debt. Um, it's uh, initiated by the Ombudsman uh, uh, of Amsterdam. Um, you're most welcome, but not only on these, but these, all the other evenings we're going to organize for you, with you, the coming year. Thank you for attending opening night at Pakhuis de Zwijger. Thank you. Thank you.